A very good morning to our listeners in Austria. Good afternoon to our listeners and viewers here in Asia. My name is Michael. I am the host of uh, this second Austrian Technology Day in our three days of Austrian Technology Days here in Asia 2022. Uh, this Austrian Technology Day is brought to you by the Austrian Federal Ministry for Climate Action, Environment, Energy, Mobility, Innovation and Technology. Uh, further on, I will call it BMK, as we call it in Austria. It's more easier and short. Uh, it's also in close cooperation with the Austrian Chamber of Commerce and the Austrian uh, Research Promotion Agency. The Austrian technology is brought to you uh, via the new framework we have established in our ministry. Uh, that is the Export Initiative. Uh, it's a very pretty impressive tool. You can access it online on www.texport.at. And there you can see all the Austrian companies in the various technology sectors uh, like railways, transport, energy, and also our major topic of today, waste. So yesterday, uh, Christina, my host from yesterday, told us that uh, the platform, the online platform of TechSport works like Tinder. I didn't know what that is, so I had to Google it. But now I know it's exactly same, same, but different. So we are focusing mainly on technologies on that platform. So whenever you have interest in Austrian technologies, Austrian companies, take a look at that homepage and you will find everything you need. Now, today we are covering waste. I would say beside of uh, climate change and the other major topics uh, which are pretty much of interest at the moment, waste is one of the biggest and not only here in Asia but all over the world. But today we will focus here in Asia on the waste topic. Um, before I start, Yesterday, Christina was wearing red, white, red, the Austrian colors. So I thought I'd bring in some local content with my nice shirt. So can anybody guess in which country I'm currently posted on behalf of BMK? Yeah, correct. I'm in Jakarta, Indonesia. Now, let's start without much further ado. The Austrian Technology Days are a brilliant forum where you can mingle, meet other people, discuss technologies that might be of interest for your business, for your uh, doings. Now, ah, reminds me of a little story of history of Austria. In 1900, two gentlemen met, Mr. Burstin and Mr. Porsche. Yeah, exactly, that Mr. Porsche, later on constructing sports cars. And they two constructed one could say the first armored personal carrier in the world with a manually operated machine gun turret. They presented it to the Austrian emperor, but the technology was very new, very loud. So the horse of the joint chief of staff threw him off and he was lying in the mud. The emperor looked down and said, I don't think we need that specific technology for Austria, but you can imagine how big the eyes of the Austrian Joint Chief of Staff was when the tanks approached 1916, the Austrian trenches during World War I. What I wanted to say with this little story of history is keep an open mind, try to get as much knowledge and know-how from today's meeting and make the very best out of it. Now, I would like uh, to give the floor now to Mr. Macharot from Alba. He will give us a brief uh, keynote speech about uh, waste management and how it's handled here in Asia. I'm sure it will be pretty interesting because most of us uh, don't have a clue what is going on outside of Europe. So Mr. Macharat, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lido. Yeah, Welcome from my end as well. Um, I'm delighted um, to have this very uh, short keynote um, and warm up uh, everybody for this uh, small event. Um, I'm going to give you a quick um, presentation slide deck, um, which um, yeah, is really meant as a warm up um, for this very interesting day, followed by 
um, the keynote from Vienna and then the very interesting panel discussion with um, the local experts from the countries. Okay, um, I would like, since this is the uh, Austin Tech Days, come a little bit from a European perspective. Um, I will give you a little bit information about uh, who we are uh, and what a European waste management company is doing in Asia. Um, I'll share a little bit uh, where I'm located. I'm in Singapore, uh, what we have done in the last two years in Singapore um, and what's um, yeah, uh, in the agenda in Singapore um, in the next, uh, well, in this decade. Um, then I will give a quick overview of uh, Southeast Asia, um, but very uh, roughly since we have a very interesting panel discussion uh, on the details on that. Um, yeah, and that's basically um, how I want to get this event started. Okay, um, let me start a little bit on uh, who we are. Alba um, is a originally German-based family-owned company for 50 years now in the waste management era, still family-owned uh, by those two gentlemen, uh, Mr. Axel Schweitzer and Mr. Erik Schweitzer, um, and it, active in Asia uh, for more than 20 years now. Um, yeah, in Asia, we are working on uh, different entities um, in the hazardous waste field, in a biodegradable uh, food waste organic treatment, uh, in the field of plastics recycling, and the field where I am at the moment posted at, uh, which is smart city solutions, which is uh, the classical waste management um, in uh, developing countries um, and large metropolis like Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, Jakarta, Thailand, um, Bangkok, and so on, um, with the means of modern technologies. Um, maybe one uh, important message for our European um, interested parties uh, in this uh, webinar. Um, the, the gentleman you see, the younger gentleman, um, it's called Axel Schweitzer. He is relocated to Hong Kong um, for more than 10 years now, I think. So um, he really made it his personal commitment um, to develop Asia. Um, he, and he really hasn't left Hong Kong, I think, for the last two years thanks to COVID. Um, and I think that is maybe the first message which I would bring uh, across uh, to the companies in Europe. Um, when you're going to Asia, please be committed. Yeah, um, It is far away from Europe. It is um, uh, six, seven hours time difference. Um, and if you're not somehow present, even these days with all the virtual meetings, if you're not present there and you don't show commitment, it's going to be tough. So, um, But if you're here, you have a huge market um, and a very interesting one, um, which actually is a lot of fun. Um, coming a little bit to the first country um, in my keynote, which is where, where I'm posted in Singapore. Um, why do I start with Singapore? Because I think it's um, in terms of size, the closest to Austria. Um, it has um, 6 million people living here now, uh, compared to the 9 million living in Austria and from the state of living um, and um, the way how we use, how the Europeans live, um, it's probably the closest, yeah. So, and it's a very good place to start business in Southeast Asia uh, with uh, the government control um, and um, the ease of making business over here. Um, it's very business friendly environment. Um, so we started in Singapore, um, actually looking into it 2017. I started um, to join international tenders, which Singapore is uh, very open for international bidders to bid for. Um, one, uh, the first sector, which is called uh, Jurong, which is a public waste collection contract. Um, in end of uh, 2019, then we had to relocate and set up uh, the operation within four months um, and started since 1st of April 2020 to be active in Singapore um, as um, then the only international uh, recycling organization in the field of 
Papyrus collection. Um, then uh, in February um, 21, we won another project is, that is to be the uh, producer responsibility scheme operator for electronic waste for the entire island of Singapore. Um, we also started in July um, a very new innovative uh, uh, collection project to collect shoes, uh, to convert them into um, uh, shoe granules and make them to sports flooring. Um, instead of using uh, virgin rubber material. Um, and since 1st of January um, this year, uh, we have our second public waste collection contract in the North, which is called Woodlands and Gishun. So the last two years, um, we have been able to um, set up four major projects. Um, and that shows the speed um, that um, is possible in Southeast Asia. Um, um, it is usually much faster than uh, Europeans know from their home markets. Um, they have usually less uh, time to develop. Um, decisions actually are faster. Hiring is faster um, than in Europe. So we can grow fast um, in the region. Okay. Um, looking forward, uh, staying a little bit more into Singapore. Um, uh, one definitely benefit um, of this small country is that it has a very reliable government. Um, so all initiatives that have been announced in 2017 are actually happening. Um, so you can trust if the Singapore government wants to build something, it's going to get built. Um, and also um, more or less in the timeline, plus minus maybe a couple of months, um, let's say anticipate. Um, so it's not like I'm from Berlin, so it's not like the Berlin airport where um, things take forever. Um, yeah, looking a little bit what's coming uh, this year. Uh, so last year they started um, the e waste EPR scheme and built a multi story recycling facility where interested companies can rent out uh, lots uh, for recycling activities. Um, this year, mandatory packaging reporting is starting for an um, advanced producer responsibility scheme. Um, 2023, most likely there will be a deposit refund scheme, so like a fund system, uh, as we know it from Europe. Um, the end, furthermore, 2024, there will be uh, large uh, recycling facilities coming upstream and uh, food waste is going to get tackled. Um, and 2025, um, the EPR for packaging is supposed to come up, all with the target of um, by 2030 to achieve a recycling rate of 70%, double land productivity and produce 30% 30 30, 30 of the food locally. Um, they're doing all those actions because they're only landfill, semi-cover landfill is expected to be full 2035, which is much earlier than they expected. Um, yeah, so with this um, plan uh, set up by the government, there are a lot of opportunities um, and Singapore is very welcoming for international technologies um, in the field of food waste collection and transportation. Um, the whole deposit refund scheme has to be set up from, from scratch reverse vending machines, return station technologies, all of that. Um, plastics is going to become a big topic as well. Um, so all the plastic recycling activities, be it mechanical recycling or chemical recycling, is um, there will be a market for that here. Um, and smart systems, IoT is always a topic. Um, yeah. Challenges if you're gonna go into Singapore, um, just so I'll just tell you a little bit of the downside. Um, lack of high costs, lack of high cost of land. So land is really, really scarce. So they have to build up actually in height, even for industrial facilities. Um, currently, there's not a lot of uh, source separated materials. So whenever you wanna establish new recycling initiatives, you have to also think of how to get the collection done. Manpower is extremely scarce. 
uh, very, very difficult. Um, and overall, it's still a price driven market. It's not very large. Um, they have strong local players as well. Um, so be ready for competition if you go to Singapore. Okay, um, now I'm going to widen a bit uh, the view. Uh, I'm looking into Southeast Asia, uh, which have uh, much more larger markets than uh, Singapore. Um, again, I will keep that part brief as we have this uh, interesting panel discussion coming up. Um, but you can see from just this overview, I think Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Thailand, and Vietnam, um, I think are very interesting countries in terms of um, how much waste is generated uh, and how much people are living in those countries. Um, and you can see um, that also the waste generation per capita, which is usually a sign of the development status, um, obviously Singapore is going through the roof is. Um, if you think of Austria, Austria has around 1.4 kilograms of um, uh, kilogram per capita per day. Yeah? So Malaysia is almost on that level. Uh, Thailand is um, at one kg. Um, Brunei Jerusalem is actually in that dimension. So um, a lot of countries in the region now um, with their current growth uh, coming into similar waste generation patterns as we see in Europe. Um, and that uh, shows a little bit the market we're having here. Um, so a little bit on the key issues um, for, from an European perspective. Um, so usually what you, um, if you connect uh, Southeast Asian, often the whole ocean plastics is becoming the most uh, imminent topic, um, the most hot topic, the topic that is gaining the most attraction. Um, the entire plastic management. Yeah? Uh, I want to give a little bit on my view on that, uh, where what the key issues for this are. Um, one part is uh, basically that um, a lot of plastics recycling activities, which were, have been done in China, um, are not possible any longer uh, since China closed uh, the borders uh, for importing waste. Um, so that is definitely um, a big shockwave, which also you can see in Europe, in the European recycling technology. Um, you have to increase consumption, which I just said. Um, often uh, the, the waste management budgets of the municipalities are not uh, matched yet, I would say, um, to cope with that increasing consumption and the increasing amount of plastics in particular. Um, so, you would basically have um, often not an existing collection infrastructure to handle it. Um, you have also very often, um, instead of having public waste collectors, uh, like we know from Europe, there's a, a large informal sector, especially in Indonesia, um, which has a very, very, very effective way of uh, collecting uh, PET, for example, um, via informal channels. So um, if you want to work in Southeast Asia, from my view, you have to cooperate with the informal sector um, to make it a usable system. Um, and the last element, which is now uh, coming with the negative press of for all the larger producers, um, is that they are really trying to tackle the issue of ocean plastics and do activities in the region. So compared to maybe the European market, where usually waste management is often handled by, um, by municipalities, here also the producers um, will be um, a very, very important stakeholder uh, to set up any kind of waste management activities. <clears throat> OK. Um, yeah, so what does that mean in terms of technology? Um, chemical recycling is a big topic, especially for um, low value plastics and mechanical recycling technologies uh, for high valuable plastics. All of those are very um, 
in demand, uh, organic waste recycling, uh, maybe, and waste to energy is definitely uh, on demand. Digitalization um, is definitely on demand, especially if you manage to cooperate with the informal sector via digital means. Yeah, so that is definitely a very um, interesting solution for, for those uh, markets. Um, automation, especially in the countries where, like Singapore, where uh, land and people are getting scarce. Um, and in terms of um, systems as a whole, um, people who can support setting up extended producer responsibility schemes and deposit to fund schemes, um, they definitely will have uh, some interesting market opportunities in Southeast Asia. Um, and last but not least, um, also the governments are doing a lot. Yeah, So you can see in all just that three countries now, um, Malaysia's roadmap towards uh, zero single use plastics, Thailand's roadmap on plastic management, uh, and Singapore's zero waste master plan, uh, which also is tackling plastics um, as one part, um, shows that um, all the governments are actively in, engaging it. Yeah. So, and that will also create a lot of momentum um, in the whole region uh, in terms of waste management practices. Um, yeah. So, overall, um, after now two years here in the region, I must say it's a very dynamic region. There's a lot of movement, there's a lot of development, um, and um, it's a very interesting. Uh, and great opportunity for an intercultural cooperation between local companies um, and European technology providers. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Mr. Macharot. That was a very thorough overview about the situation uh, of waste management here in Asia. Also shedding some light on uh, the situation in Singapore. And you also gave us a good outlook what can be expected here in Asia uh, in the waste management sector. So thank you very much uh, for your participation today and your good keynote speech. I would now like uh, to lead over to the Austrian aspect of waste management. Uh, today we have a special guest from the city of Vienna. Uh, Ms. Ableidinger, or Dr. Ableidinger, to be correct in the Austrian ways, <laughs> is uh, joining the city of Vienna already in the year 2005. Uh, there she was uh, head of operations for waste management, street cleaning, uh, and is now the deputy head of the Department of Public Relations and External Affairs. So she will show us a very proficient Austrian system because uh, Vienna, I think, uh, got elected for several years consecutively by Mercer as one of the most livable cities in the world and also due to the waste management system, I presume. So I will give now the floor to Dr. Bleidinger. Thank you. Thank you and thank you for your kind um, introduction. Um, well, uh, yes, Mr. Lederer will be the, so kind to share the slides for me. A good morning from Vienna. Um, I've got now the chance to tell you something about the Viennese waste management model. It's an integrative model for waste management of a big city. And um, you can see here an international best practice example. That's what we are seeing from outside. So. To give you an overview, let's come to the first slide. Um, you all might know that Vienna is the capital city of Austria, but at the same time, it is an Austrian province and that's important on the topic of waste management because um, the legal background is always very important how um, on the question, how can a waste management and municipal waste management work? And here in Vienna, we have got the situation that on the one hand, we uh, are under the Austrian federal waste management law, but on the other hand, due to the fact that Vienna is a province, there is also a separate Viennese waste management law. And beside these two aspects, uh, there is of course uh, the legal 
uh, basic guidelines from the EC, which are very important for our work. You can see here Vienna has got about 2 million inhabitants. So compared to Southeast East Asian cities, we are a little village, but for Europe, um, we are a big city. And I now want to show you, give you some info, inf information how we are dealing with the waste management. So next slide, please. I was, I was asked to, um, no, the one before would be great. Yes. To um, tell something about waste management in Vienna, to tell something about incineration. It's correct. Waste incineration is um, one of the important puzzle stones of WSNI's waste management, but only talking about that would not give you the right um, view. Therefore, I want to start with another um, uh, another important aspect on the next slide. And um, yes, in Vienna, the city of Vienna is responsible for the entire chain of municipal waste management. That means uh, that the city uh, is performing the planning of municipal waste management. We are doing the collection on our own. We are doing the treatment in different plants. And even for that, what's on the end of the treatment over for the last leftovers from incineration, they are disposed within the boundaries of Vienna. That's very different to other cities. Um, I also want to point out that there is no uh, residual waste treat, um, put on landfill untreated in Vienna for more than 10 years for a long time. Uh, and uh, that, um, that aspect of taking the responsibility of waste and treating it within the boundaries of the city is um, a deep contrast to other cities where you just take the rubbish, ship it away and don't know about it anymore. To go in detail, I want to show you how, um, on, on the next slide, on the example of residual waste, of mixed waste, um, how the chain of waste management of the waste disposal chain works in Vienna. Before you start collection, you need some background. For example, there is a Viennese Waste Management Act, as I told you before, but there also is a Viennese Waste Management Plan and a Viennese Waste Prevention Plan. These two plans are um, worked out every five or six years in, a, in a, um, um, we call it a strategic and um, a strategic analysis uh, project where we work together with experts, also with um, environmental uh, NGOs, working out how should uh, Vienna's waste management perform in the next years, how should it uh, go on? And on that, um, on that plans, then we can start working. And uh, working means on the example of residual waste that um, every day the waste trucks of the city, as you can see here, one of them in orange, uh, go out in the city, collect uh, the waste, which are about 516,000 tons per year, bring that to one of the three waste incineration plants that are all, all three are within Vienna. And after, uh, in, the, in the incineration plant, uh, there is heat and electricity power produced and also used in Vienna. And after incineration, there is still uh, something left, slags and ashes are left. And for these material, this material, we've got um, a treatment plant. There we can separate the metal out of the slags and ashes, put the metals in recycling and the least 
combustion residues go to landfill, uh, which is landfill Rautenweg, also here in Vienna. Um, sometimes uh, people from other countries ask me, okay, sounds quite interesting, but why do you put that material on the landfill? That's due to the current Austrian federal law. It's not allowed at the moment to put this material in further recycling, for example, use that for building streets or uh, other building industry. So these last leftovers today have to go to landfill. So um, this is the chain of waste management and that gives us a chance because there's plenty, plenty of incineration capacity in Vienna. Um, that we do not go to landfill with residual waste. But um, especially technicians uh, under you might know, plants do not work every day. There are plant stops in incineration plants. There could be unplanned stops. And if you are responsible for waste management uh, in a city, hmm, you also need a solution for these days. And for these days, uh, next slide, please. We have got a waste logistic, not the one before, yeah, the waste logistic center. So for days where there is not enough um, combustion com capacities, we have got the waste, waste logistic center where we can make splitting, bailing, and temporarily storing um, of waste until the moment where the capacity is, uh, the full capacity is back again, and then these bales go to incineration. So on the next slide, I can also show you the long time development. Mr. Lederer started in the morning with the year 1900 when our emperor was not so keen of the idea of automobiles. Um, yeah, in fact, he also was not so keen on waste incineration. Therefore, the first um, waste incineration plant on the European continent was built in Budapest. Um, also, when our former emperor was not so fine with new innovations, he said, oh, well, just try that first in Budapest with um, subway system, <laughs> metro system, it was the same. Therefore, we started with waste incineration in Vienna a little bit later, which was somehow a good idea because later we also had good environmental technologies <laughs> for waste incineration plant, which is a very important aspect. So here you can see the long-term development of the amount of collected residual waste in Vienna. That's the orange line. And you can see in the first half of the second uh, of the 20th century, there was not much going on, a quite steady development, a little drop down during the Second World War, but then came the 1960s and the waste uh, quantities started rising and rising. Um, consumption changed deeply, uh, people had more money to uh, buy things and to throw things away. And at the same time, we started waste incineration in Vienna and using the energy that is in that rubbish for uh, local district heating. And you see the dark gray line, which is the amount of thermal treatment in Vienna. So in the 1960s, we opened the, the first incineration plant, then the second, then we almost had enough um, capacity to burn all the residual waste, but the uh, quantities become more and more and more. And that was one of the reasons that we started quite early in the early 1990s with um, separate collection of recyclables. Therefore, this gray line and the uh, green amount, that is separate collected uh, recyclables that go to recycling, that 
did not need it to go either to incineration or to uh, landfill. And since we could open the third incineration plant, the Fafenau in year 2009, there is no residual waste going to landfill anymore. And um, yeah, next slide, please. Um, that's important um, to avoid disposal of, of residual waste. Here you can see the quite well known um, pyramid of um, how to deal with the waste, starting on the top with prevention. Best waste is the waste prevented. You don't have to um, deal with it and it's no harm for environment and climate and so on. If you cannot prevent, try to reduce, for example, with reuse um, things, um, Therefore, the city of Vienna has got a lot of projects fostering waste prevention and reuse. If you can not prevent or reuse, do recycling for recycling, uh, for high quality recycling, it's important to focus on a good quality that you collect, because if you collect only rubbish, you can only make rubbish with that. If you make, if you make separate collection of good uh, material you can make high quality recycling and um, on the top of the top end uh, on the back end of the pyramid there is a recovery like energy recovery in uh, in in uh, combustion plants and the last last step is the disposal so now i want to go very quickly to some examples uh, of Vienna for different stages of the pyramid. For example, on next slide, you can see, um, yeah, forgot to mention, uh, it's important to point out no municipal waste goes directly to landfill in Vienna and we are using best environmental technology, which is um, so important for the trust of the citizens that we are not harming envi uh, the environment, not harming the people. Um, that was also very important for the big consensus in Vienna. Yes, it is okay, it is the best way if we build the third incineration plant in Vienna uh, after the year 2000. So now we come to the examples, for example, uh, the 48 a ton a it's a recycling shop, uh, it's a reuse shop run by the city of Vienna. In these boxes, we collect at our separate collection centers things that are still so good that you don't have to throw them away, that you don't have to waste them, but that we can sell at, in our reuse shop. You can see on next slide. This is a Vienna's reuse shop with a mm, quite nice shopping atmosphere. It's also uh, the idea behind to give people, uh, to get them in touch with the idea of reusing things on good days. Uh, there are about 1000 um, clients there per day and yeah, many people from all over the world visit, for example, this shop um, to get ideas for their own cities. Next slide refers to the topic of separate collection. And here you can see the typical um, containers for waste and uh, recyclable collections in Vienna. And the numbers might be interesting that there are about 230,000 bins in Vienna for the residual waste. And on the other hand, almost um, the same quantity of bins are in the city for the different uh, recyclable fractions. 
Um, also important for um, separate collection are our recycling centers, which you can see on the next slide as an example. Yeah, that's one of our modern separate collection centers uh, where the citizens can drop off for free many, many different um, waste fractions. If you would click, please, here you can see um, on the next slide, yeah, an overview on the materials that are separately collected on these collection centers. So I see that I'm a little bit running short of time. Therefore, we change to the composting plant. The composting plant of the city is uh, one of the biggest in Europe with an input material of about 100,000 tons of garden waste, green waste per year. Uh, here we also focus on high quality of input material. So for example, no food goes in there and the outcome is a triple A plus um, compost that is of a quality that can also be used in organic farming. Next slide shows you uh, the biogas plant. In this biogas plant, um, we produce from kitchen waste biogas that can use like fossil gas in Vienna. Next slide shows, um, yes, one of the uh, incineration plants in Vienna, the newest one, the Pfaffenau. It uh, replaces the uh, combustion of primary fuel, fuels for district heating and is therefore also an important climate protection measure. Next slide shows the treatment plant for slags and ashes, where we grab out the metals of the slags and ashes from the incineration. And on the next slide, you see the landfill of Vienna, where we can depose, dispose the residuals from incineration. So yeah, next slide gives you an overview of that. And um, sometimes I've been asked, well, will you need that in the future? What about, next slide, please, the idea of zero waste. Hmm? I think zero waste is a great vision <clears throat> and we are all working on that. But as long as there is waste occurring, we have to deal with that in a good environmental friendly, climate friendly way. And on the topic of um, disposal of slags and ashes, today we have to put it on landfill. Perhaps in the future there will be other solutions. So on next slide, you can see um, an overview on climate protection measures we are doing in Vienna, but that would be perhaps um, the basis for another presentation at another time. On the next slide, you see uh, our headquarter, which had been changed more than 10 years ago to a green facade and is now very well known in Vienna. And um, on next slide, you see also one of our innovations. We were very proud. We had been very proud to present the first full electric waste collection truck um, in Austria two years ago. And it's one of the projects uh, that we tried to foster to come to a more clean climate friendly future. So next slide, please. The, um, our approach is uh, that the waste management sector needs to be seen. We need big cooperation with the citizens. We need the trust of the citizens. And we are quite happy that on that aspect, we are on a good way. Also important for us is always to learn from others 
and at the same time we uh, also are happy if somebody else comes to us and wants to learn from us so next slide please you can see here on the next slide um, on one one of the groups visiting us visiting our um, landfill site in years before the pandemic situation, for example, 2,800 people visited our facilities. People um, from all over the world came to us, 19 international delegations. And therefore, next slide, please, perhaps one day the day might come and we can welcome you in Vienna. So for the moment, I want to say thank you. Next slide, please, for the opportunity to tell you, to give you some information on the waste management system in Vienna. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bleidinger. That was pretty awesome. Very impressive what Vienna has achieved in the waste management sector. Uh, yeah. Awesome, really. I already brought several delegations uh, to your <laughs> office, so <laughs> I contributed to the 2,800 visitors. <laughs> right. And also, uh, thank you very much indeed that you came back to my little story of 1900. So we're now closing the circle, no? <laughs> so now I would like to uh, lead over to our panel discussion. Uh, I can see that uh, our panelists have already arrived. So I can see by Andreas Devat Moko from Indonesia. Hi. Good afternoon. I can Good see January. Elina Jani from Malaysia. Hello. Also, Mr. Patrapol Tularak from Thailand. And last but definitely not least, uh, Isabelita Paredes Mercado from Philippines. Good afternoon to you all. Good afternoon, Bart. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So for, I would say, as I can see you here on the screen, uh, I will go clockwork wise uh, to start the discussion. First, I would like to ask you, maybe you can elaborate what are the biggest challenges your respective countries are facing now. But before we go into depth, I would like to introduce uh, the panelists one by one. So Papa Andreas uh, was co-founder and founder of several companies. It's pretty impressive if I see your CV here, how many companies you founded. And currently you are working at Bali, uh, Bersi Lestari, uh, especially in renewable energy technology sector, also promoting technology transfer, also one of the major topics of uh, this uh, event today. And you are also operating six bioraffineries for solid, liquid, and gas biofuels. So very warm welcome to you. Next on my screen is uh, Ms. Elina Jani. 15 years of experience in the field and so many companies you have nurtured to success. Very, very impressive. So, oh, microbiology you studied too. I thought my study history was already complicated, but microbiology is the next level. Oh. Uh, you're also very active in climate change uh, cooperation of the Malaysian green technology sector. Very warm welcome to you. Then, of course, Mr. Patrapol Tularak from uh, Thailand. Oh, I can see you studied in Dresden. So I think you speak a little German. Oh, we cannot hear you at the moment. There seems to be a slight glitch in the technology. Mr. Tulara, can you hear me? Okay, obviously yes, but no, we can't hear you. Okay, I'll come back to you a little later. 
So let's first uh, introduce Ms. Elisabetta Paredes Mercado, the president of Basic Environmental Systems and Technologies Incorporated, short BEST, a member of uh, IPM Holdings, IPM Group of Companies. And she is specialized in waste management operation of the IPM Group. So hopefully now, but Mr. Tularak. Hello. Modern technology at its best. We can see you, but can't hear you. Okay, maybe the problem can be fixed. We will try and fix the problem in the back end, and the oh, technical okay. team, the technical team, will so, try and fix this. But as we have two speakers before Mr. Tularak, I would uh, suggest that uh, Baba Andreas, uh, you start. Can you please elaborate? How do you think, or what are the biggest challenges Indonesia is facing when it comes to waste and waste management? Papa Andreas, the floor is yours. Thank you, pa Michael Rederer. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Asians in Indonesia. Uh, from a point of view of practitioners of waste management, not in the government sectors. I'm not in the government working for the government, but I know I work together with them. And I know the situations that we face today is COVID-19 refocusing of the funding. <laughs> so the one commitment that is made into a strategic plan, like in Dr. Martina explains, there's a federal plan that will be implemented in the municipal level or the provincial level. Same in Indonesia, we have a national plan, national strategy implemented gradually since 19, uh, since 2008. And every year there's an improvement in the regulation side based on this grand strategy. And the latest being the regulations by the presidential decree number one, January 2021, which prevent all the municipal government, all the governor of Indonesia to practice a landfill. They are not allowed to do any more landfill by June. The implications of this is that the collections, separations, and the use of this municipal solid waste must be handled in the village level for the habitat, for the households. But for industries, there's different uh, regulations applied. Again, we live in a very sparse islands countries with 17,000 islands, not just like in small states like Singapore, like Mr. Thomas doing with Alba and Dr. Martina in the small city of, of Vienna. Jakarta alone has already 13 million populations and we don't have any land to do the, 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 the recycling. The government of Jakarta is confused with where do we want to do the, the processing? They don't have any, any spare lands to, to spend. So answering your question, Mr. Leder, what is the biggest challenge is, is to continue the strategic plan that is already in place with limited budget that being used for buying the vaccines and uh, doing our what we can do best through opening the opportunity of recycling to private sector, to the NGOs, uh, doing the plastics bottles, uh, polyethylene processing done in all over Indonesia by, by small scale uh, operations. But from the government side, I can explain uh, the latest development, which is from September 2021 until today, January 2022, the government released funds 
under the Ministry of Public Works, around $100 million to develop the 3R, which is delayed for two years. It's just being developed. And I'm in Bali, witness uh, about 60 municipal, uh, not village level, uh, 3R facilities being erected. And one of the companies or cooperative that I uh, supported supply the, the basic equipment, like for the separations, the uh, press equipment, and other equipment for these villages in Bali. And I know that six provinces in Indonesia receive the same kind of, of, of government support, central government support to develop their three R facilities. Again, the question is, are we going to use the biggest stream of this waste, which is biomass, to energy or to compost or to make other materials like we refine it to make a biofuel instead of burning it and just taking the thermal potentials of it, like in Vienna examples. Uh, so the governor of Bali last year issued a governor regulations uh, that mandates populations in Bali to do the separations in their homes, in their facilities, schools, restaurants, hotels, uh, hospitals, and then separate these materials uh, to be processed by different entities according to their specifications of waste. But the, for the biomass, which is, I, I can say, 60% of the bio, uh, municipal waste streams in Indonesia, on most of the cities in Indonesia, is biomass. And this biomass are being proposed by the government also to be used by the state energy company, state electricity company, PLN, to be co-burning with the coal plant in many cities in Indonesia. The question is, if this is practice, then what will be happen to the dioxins? Because the existing coal plant, coal power plant, don't have these carbon capture sequestrations on their chimneys. There's a lot of investments to be made to make this waste, bio waste, to be coal burned in the coal plant. That's the biggest challenge that I think present in Indonesia. Pat Michael, give it back to you. Thank you, Papa Andreas. So, as I understand it correctly, it's just a question of implementation and not so more yes. of the ideas. The ideas are already there, so it's just the implementation that should be tackled. Hopefully Indonesia does that in the future, but I don't know what the impact might be of now moving Jakarta uh, to the new capital, <laughs> Nusantara. <laughs> but there is one solution to one of your challenges. You have the land there. <laughs> yes, true. To set up a recycling station, no? <laughs> and we are going to be close to Bu Elina. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so give the pollution, was... the air yeah. more pollution to Malaysia. <laughs> no, not sending pollution to Malaysia. <laughs> Get the know from Malaysia. <laughs> I would like to hand over now to uh, Miss Elina Jani uh, from Malaysia to get her. Uh, point of view, what are the biggest challenges? As we already heard from uh, Mr. Thomas, Malaysia is very highly developed when it comes to waste management, but I'm sure you still find some challenges. So Ms. Elena, the, play, the floor is yours. All right, uh, thank you very much, Michael. Uh, and appreciate uh, Bapa Andreas' uh, comment earlier. Hopefully, Malaysia and Indonesia will collaborate together, and we will definitely welcome the new capital being close to us so that we can uh, have more cross border collaborations. Yeah, I think um, Malaysia, uh, being, uh, I guess, uh, uh, mid tier uh, uh, developing uh, country in uh, ASEAN, uh, we do have challenges with respect to solid waste management sector. Uh, and uh, I'm speaking uh, representing of uh, Malaysian Green Technology and Climate Change uh, Corporation, where we monitor uh, the progress and also uh, the 
challenges and also the solutions that we propose uh, from the perspective of um, climate change. Uh, so we look at it upon uh, the purview under our Ministry of Environment and Water, uh, and we constantly look at uh, sustainable and green technologies that will be able to uh, provide solutions uh, to not only the waste sector, uh, but also energy building, transport, uh, water sector, as well as manufacturing sector. Uh, but uh, with respect to the question from Michael earlier, uh, I think Malaysia, we're faced with challenges uh, to solid waste management sector, mostly because of increase of population. Uh, although we are not as big as Indonesia, uh, I think uh, the last audited number back in 2020, Malaysia is about 32.37 million, uh, which is just the size of Jakarta compared to Indonesia. Uh, but uh, we do have an annual growth rate of at least 1.4%. Uh, so this is where with the increase of population uh, and then also the uh, forecast that 70% of the population will be living in cities in another eight years. Uh, so we do anticipate that, uh, uh, you know, the challenges will be rising uh, if not, uh, you know, will be, uh, if, if not uh, handled properly from here onwards. Uh, besides that, of course, tourism, uh, Malaysia is also very big in tourism. So I think, uh, you know, the COVID-19 sort, sort of stopped that uh, international tourists coming to Malaysia, but uh, now I guess some uh, are coming back. Uh, but at the same time, the domestic tourism is still ongoing. Uh, and this is also uh, related closely to the public attitude uh, among the residents or citizens of Malaysia. Uh, I, think, uh, I think in many countries, the biggest issue is actually, and especially developing countries, uh, the segregation of waste at source. Uh, I think that's still a major challenge uh, in Malaysia, although we are uh, a developing country, but uh, the mindset uh, is still need to uh, look into you know, a first world mentality uh, where we look at uh, segregation at source, recycling, reducing, uh, and then of course looking at uh, ways to reuse and also a uh, proper way to dispose of the waste. Uh, last but not least, of course, the economic growth as well. Uh, as the economic growth goes up for Malaysia in terms of our GDP, uh, so does the carbon emissions. Uh, and this is where our efforts come in to decouple uh, the carbon emissions from the many sectors, including the waste sector, uh, as we also increase in terms of our economic growth. Um, I guess the current situation in waste management in Malaysia, uh, recycling rates uh, at 2020 was recorded at 30%. Uh, it's not that high as compared to any uh, developed countries, uh, but uh, another sister agency uh, under our Ministry of Housing and Local Government, uh, which is the Solid Waste Corporation, uh, they have set targets uh, of about 40% uh, uh, recycling rate by 2025. So. Uh, Mm -hmm. The plan uh, that was uh, presented by our Prime Minister uh, back in September 2021. And uh, the concept and the emphasis is put into... Oh, we lost Miss Elena again. ...original source. Uh, so that's the main uh, uh, anthems that we're looking at in terms of circular economy. Uh, introducing the concept of reproducer responsibility. Uh, so basically intensifying EPR manufacturers uh, to improve implementation of sustainable consumption and also production, which is uh, the SDG goal number 12. Uh, in addition, uh, the government is also promoting a lot more green investments uh, to continue to be encouraged, especially for projects under public and private partnership. Uh, as well as uh, under our government-linked companies uh, in Malaysia. Uh, so this is uh, where we're setting the target of uh, uh, that 40% by 2025. Uh, but the national household recycling rate is hoped to be increased to 30.7%, uh, uh, and then also encouraging government green procurement as well as part of circular economy. Uh, businesses, we hope to be encouraging them to adopt the concept of circular economy in design, production, uh, logistics, consumption, and waste management of their products and also services. And then, of course, looking at all this, uh, we also look into uh, a better uh, additions or 
uh, what do you call it, uh, enhancements to our existing legislations. For example, we have the Environmental Quality Act uh, 1974, which recites uh, with our sister agency in the Ministry of Environment and Water, which is the Department of Environment. Uh, and of course, the Solid Waste and Public Cleansing Management Act uh, 2007. Uh, and also our Scheduled Waste Regulation 2005. Uh, we want to promote resource circulation uh, via the legislations, the action plans, the roadmaps, uh, as well as legal frameworks uh, that will be established to promote circular economy. Uh, but uh, uh, just to conclude uh, my, the, my answer to the question, to successfully implement a circular economy, a top-down and also bottom-up approach is required. Uh, and currently, Malaysia, we don't have any explicit uh, top-down or bottom-up approaches. Uh, so this is where we're looking to learn more from the implementations uh, that have been done in Vienna, for example, uh, and then also many business companies that are here uh, to also look at it, for, not from the perspective of government only, uh, but also to look at the perspective of business mechanisms uh, that will be able to be implemented uh, to create a win-win situation uh, for all. Yeah, thank you. And back to you, uh, Michael. Thank you, Ms. Elena. Very good points that you mentioned. Uh, yes, you don't need only the top-down approach, also the bottom-up uh, approach. And also you have to generate the right mindset of the people that they really uh, are keen on recycling because they know they have the output then of a cleaner environment and therefore more livable city. And you also mentioned already one of the major topics of uh, waste management is always money, but one solution might be PPP. And Ms. Uh, Paredes Mercado uh, from uh, the Philippines is very active in PPP. Actually, she has already one uh, landfill, one sanitary landfill opened via PPP. Maybe you can elaborate on that a bit. And of course, what are the major challenges uh, the Philippines are facing? in the waste management sector. The floor is yours. Please turn on the microphone. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, a pleasant day, everyone. I hope you are all keeping well and safe. Well, please allow me to give you the background and the present situation in the country, in our country, Philippines. The Philippines with a population of about 122 million, just like other countries in the Southeast Asian region, is facing a problem on increasing waste generation. The projected waste generation for 2022 is 22.3 million tons. Well, the NCR, the National Capital Region, with its estimated population of over 12 million, is the biggest producer right now. And it, it produced about 3.5 billion metric tons of garbage last year, or 9,553 tons per day. Of course, it will remain to be a major challenge in the Philippines, especially in the highly urbanized areas, and with the estimated waste generation per capita of 0.5 to 1 kilo per day. And the, however, the biggest portion of that waste generated is biodegradable at 54%. Recyclable waste at 27%. Residual waste, 17%. And 2% special waste. Now, being an island group composed of three major islands, Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao, and other small islands, that's about 7,000. Waste collection and transport, as well as the availability of waste treatment and recycling facilities is a big challenge. Waste collection efficiency in metro areas and cities are okay, they're good. Although waste being collected, as everybody here says, are mixed waste. People do not like to segregate waste. Although the government's trying everything 
to of course to do the waste diversion in that manner and recycling. The municipal solid waste are composed of 56.7% residential waste and 27% commercial, 12% institutional, and 4% industrial. Now, the mandatory requirements under the law calls for mandatory waste diversion. So the local government units shall divert at least as mandated 25% of all solid waste through reuse, recycling, composting, and other resource recovery activities. The waste diversion goal, however, remain poorly complied with. The law also mandates the barangays, cities, municipalities, provinces, business and industries, institutions, and individuals to segregate and manage the waste properly. Even putting ordinances banning or regulating the use of single-use plastics is, strict, is not strictly followed. Now, there are in our country, 189 sanitary landfills to receive the waste, servicing 399 out of a total of 1,674 cities and municipalities. Well, that's an awful percent, meaning we need a lot of this thing. And so the government with minimal budget to provide for treatment and disposal of waste, as well as develop, enhance, and replicate sustainable programs. So what they did now, being aware of the big challenges coming, it has welcomed and is welcoming private sector to offer technologies or establish sanitary landfills and other technologies to improve recycling, resource recovery or waste to energy programs or technologies under a public private partnership program to help solve the problem on waste management. So there we are and we as a company, we have been doing and we have started, we already are uh, successfully done already with the government public-private partnership, uh, putting up sanitary lab fields at first now. And then later, maybe we can mention about what other initiatives we are doing in this case. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ms. Paredes Mercado. It was very interesting insight into the Philippines. Uh, but I take it there's still a lot to do, especially <laughs> the awareness uh, of the people for segregation and recycling. Yes. Um, I would like to hand over now to Mr. Patrapul Tularak. Hopefully uh, we can hear him now uh, when he's uh, deactivating his microphone. Uh, he is an outspoken expert uh, in environmental topics and also in pollution and waste management but i've also read you're a professional photographer so i take it the background you have here is one of your photographs yes 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 I yeah i have some similar pictures because previously i also did a lot in uh, photographing oh. uh, i have my nice little camera always with me but since corona came along I'm not traveling that much, even though Indonesia has a lot to offer in the neighboring countries. So I changed now to watchmaking. To keep always the time. No? So Mr. Tularak, maybe you can now elaborate uh, what do you think are the biggest uh, challenges uh, in the waste management sector Thailand is facing? Mr. Tularak, the floor is yours. Thank you, Michael. Can you hear me now? Okay, thank you everyone. And uh, for, for Thailand uh, on the West, I would like to separate into three main 
aspect. The first one is the bigger one, the policy level. At the policy level, we we can see that the waste management hierarchy is not well followed. So in the past, we focus on the final disposal only landfill. And then a few years ago, we moved on to the uh, waste energy, energy recovery and recycling. But for reuse and reduce, we don't talk about that much. So this is the main problem of the policy. It's written about the reduce and reduce, but in reality, you no know, implementation. And another problem with the policy level is that the lack of enforcement, especially enforcement of the open dump site. Because in Thailand, we have about uh, 2,000, almost 3,000 disposal facility and 90% is open dump and landfill. And there's no real enforcement if you uh, pollute the leachate or even uh, open uh, landfill fire, then, then this is the, the bigger problem that we still have. Another aspect is about the awareness and perception of uh, residents of uh, general population. So we can see that a lot of people still don't segregate waste. So everywhere you see mixed waste, in only some high income or high education uh, area, then you, we can have some uh, recyclable bins that is clearly or nicely separate, but that's very little proportion compared to the whole country. And the last one is about the financial issue because waste management fee is extremely low in average, our local governments charge uh, each ho household only one dollar, one US dollar per month. And it, regardless of the amount of waste you throw, so everyone can throw all the waste as much as you want and pay only one dollar per month. So maximum, it's written in the law that maximum that local government can charge resident is 40 baht. 40 baht is about $1.3. So this is the big issue. Th then we, we had to subsidize the new facility, especially for the installation of waste energy by increase the feed in tariffs for electricity that you produce. So that's uh, about the main challenges for, for, for Thailand. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tularak. Well, we're back to the money topic now. But uh, hopefully uh, you can all give us now an idea, as a side of money, what uh, Austria in respect of technologies could provide so you can tackle some of the problems and challenges you're facing in your respective countries. So I would like to start again with uh, Baba Andreas. Maybe you can give us an idea what might be needed in Indonesia, aside money and implementation of uh, the existing rules and regulations. Baba Andreas, yeah, Baba you have Michael. the floor. Okay, ba Michael. Uh, of course, funding is needed both in Europe or in Indonesia and in Asian countries to tackle the waste problem. But to be specific in an Indonesian case, uh, due to the regulations also that apply to the energy sectors, what I can uh, open to, to not, not me to open, but I think there's a big opportunity for technology company from Austria to focus on the pre, during, and post combustion technology. Uh, so the process of, of taking this larger stream of waste, which is biomass stream, into a 
existing coal power plant, coal steam power plant, will not giving a side effect, is unintended side effect that we don't want to happen. In terms of the fit and tariff incentive from the government for the state-owned company, state-owned electricity company, it's there already. Uh, we don't have any uh, much problem like in Thailand because the household charge is quite appropriate in Indonesia, I think. It's about $5 per household uh, for a large house, but for a smaller house, it's about two and a half dollars average monthly charge for collections. For the 3R facility built by the government funds, but the operations is independent by the community. It's a Swaklola concept, uh, which the operation will be funded by the sales of recycled materials, but the constructions and the equipment is funded by the government. Of course, Indonesia cannot build the whole 3R facility in 700, uh, 75,000 villages in Indonesia in one year will take some time to, to, to complete all this strategy that we have in place. But I think for the Austrian technology company and Austrian government is to focus on the technology transfer uh, subsidies or G2G arrangements for the technology transfer for the Indonesian company to build based on the technology uh, Austrian inventions. Like let's say in the TU Vienna, they have uh, Professor Hoffenbauer have the, the best in uh, gasification technology. But for Indonesian company to, to adopt it, we have to, 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 to buy the technology transfer. We have to pay the technology transfer. Maybe the, 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 the governor of, of, or the promotion center of, of Australian technology can accommodate this. So the Indonesian energy sectors can confidently take the waste stream, particularly the, the biomass streams, into their process. And it will solve a lot of problems in many parts of Indonesia. I think that's uh, my, my suggestions, Mr. Michael. Back to you. Thank you kindly, Papa Andreas. It's a good suggestion. So the Austrian uh, technology companies are very interested in cooperating with uh, Indonesia. That's without question. Uh, also, there should be some possibility for government support. Uh, we will uh, check uh, with the ministries concerned uh, in Indonesia. And uh, hopefully uh, a good cooperation comes out where we can at least tackle some of the problems uh, you already mentioned. Yeah, uh, for, particularly for the pre, during and post combustion technology. Yeah, yeah I already heard uh, that uh, the waste, uh, especially uh, from housing is uh, very moist. So yes. that might be a challenge for the Austrian technologies because it's not so moisty in Austria <laughs> as we already segregate in the beginning. But uh, I'm sure there is a solution for every problem you mentioned. Uh, we just have to find it. But thank you, Papa Andreas. Uh, very good insight. Uh, now I would like to hand over to uh, Ms. Elina. Uh, maybe we can hear now your ideas or suggestions how Austria and Malaysia could deepen our waste management relationship. The floor is yours. All right, uh, thank you again, Michael. Uh, for the second question, I think um, from our perspective, we look beyond uh, municipal solid waste. Uh, so we look also at technologies that could expand for industrial waste, uh, agricultural waste, and also hazardous waste. Um, so I think, uh, you know, the potential cooperations or collaborations between Austria and Malaysia uh, could potentially expand two ways, not only looking at technologies, but also looking at um, business models or uh, successful mechanisms uh, that have worked uh, in Austria uh, that may be able to be emulated in Malaysia as well. Because, you know, when you talk about sustainable technologies, not just about the patented technology, but it's also about, um, you know, perhaps models or mechanisms that would work. 
uh, because it's all about mindset and human behavior, right? Um, so this is also something that we're open to collaborate. Um, so technologies or business mechanisms that could expand uh, solving organic waste. I think there's still the biggest, um, I guess, segments of waste at landfills uh, in our country is still organic waste. Uh, so looking at that, uh, as Papa Andres mentioned earlier, yes, Malaysia also we have moist waste, uh, but uh, always open to look at even mechanisms or technologies at source uh, so that we could, you know, uh, solve this uh, issue that we have. Uh, from separation at source to solutions at disposal at landfill areas. Um, also, plastic recycling and upcycling technologies uh, into various products. Uh, Malaysia, we have been exposed to many uh, forms of upcycling uh, into eco products, uh, into textile and fabric, uh, but we're always open to uh, look at uh, potential recycling and also upcycling into uh, other kinds of products that we are always open to uh, because then it would then increase uh, the number of green products, which is one of our targets under our green technology master plan. Uh, the other part would definitely be uh, electronic waste, either recycling or refurbishment. Uh, so this can even look at uh, extending to the solar sector. Uh, Malaysia is one of the biggest manufacturers of solar panel outside of China. So we do, do have a lot of um, solar panels as well. So beyond that, electrical appliances, you know, so we are looking at potential technologies, uh, research collaborations uh, that we are also open to, to look into this kind of centers that can be set up. Uh, we are looking into hydrogen technologies. Uh, so that's also another area that will be interesting to see uh, technologies from Austria. Uh, either looking at uh, various kind of feedstocks to produce hydrogen, uh, but at the same time also uh, to look at uh, the waste sector to have byproducts of hydrogen that can be utilized and applied uh, as a form of power as well as uh, utilization in transport and mobility sector. Uh, besides that, we fuse derived fuel technologies. We are also always open to that. Uh, it's still a new concept in Malaysia, but uh, it's something that uh, some of the companies in Malaysia have been embarking on. Uh, energy recovery technologies, landfill mining technologies. Uh, we have quite a number of landfills uh, in Malaysia that uh, we've converted to sanitary landfills, but we always look at you know potential effective land use. Uh, so we see a lot of that in especially the Nordic countries, but that's also something that we're open to the uh, Australian technologies as well. Uh, and then of course, uh, uh, livestock or agriculture related waste technologies and industrial waste technologies. Um, so the other things that maybe I guess soft technologies that will also apply to segregation at source and can be seen to the public in Malaysia. Uh, for example, we see a lot of that smart waste bins that Dr. Martina uh, showed earlier. So that's pretty interesting. Uh, waste level sensors. Uh, so this would then be able to uh, notify the uh, waste collection companies to uh, manage the frequencies and then also the collection better. Um, you know, uh, we are always open to artificial intelligence, uh, recycling technologies or robots, you know, kind of robotic. Uh, Malaysia is very much embracing uh, IR 4.0, Industrial Revolution 4.0. Uh, and then, of course, um, you know, solar powered trash compactors, uh, pneumatic waste pipes, uh, e waste. Kiosks, uh, we also, uh, you know, would like to look into some newer ones than others that we have here. And of course, uh, uh, soft uh, hardware, for, uh, sorry, softwares, for example, recycling apps and all that. So we see that happening a lot in developed countries uh, and we want to have more and more, uh, you know, of that kind of exposure here in Malaysia as well. So I think uh, those are the kind of various technologies that we are open to. Uh, to cooperate, uh, collaborate, and perhaps even have research on uh, in Malaysia. Yeah, thank you. Back to you, Michael. Thank you very much, Ms. Elena. Too. That was quite a list. Uh, uh, ho hopefully, <laughs> we find for every topic on your list a company. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it uh, will be interesting to see how this moves on because, uh, yeah, you have quite an intensive list. I have to agree. Too. But somehow we will manage, trust me. Um, now, Ms. Paredes Mercado, you managed to get back uh, to our panel discussion. Uh, maybe I can ask you for a short answer because uh, the B2B meetings are already starting in 30 seconds, but uh, 
I don't want to, to hinder you <laughs> for your statement. So please, you have the floor, Mr. Mercado. Uh, please turn on microphone. Okay, thank you very much, Michael. Um, yeah, I was lost earlier. Now, okay, we need efficient and affordable technologies that could uh, process the biodegradable portion of waste and generate energy, recycle the nine non-biodegradable materials and process the residuals as a means of uh, resource recovery. It is vital for the government also to consider the adoption of the best available waste to energy technologies with controlled emissions that will comply with clean air and clean water in order to increase our waste diversion and extend the life of the sanitary landfills and harness its potential as a source of energy. There is also a need for technology that can process food waste because we have so much volume being generated in this area. Also electronic waste, e-waste recycling, and also landfill mining. Now, our company, as uh, earlier mentioned, is doing some PPP projects with the government to put up sanitary landfills, which is, being, is really needed at this point. And we already have successfully uh, already have two contracts or two uh, programs with the government in that uh, areas. But having said earlier that uh, really segregation at source, which is really necessary, is not uh, being done. We initiated a program that incentivized waste segregation at source through a digitized advocacy in partnership with big institutions, companies, governments, um, and um, others, you know, schools, uh, big corporations, those who generate uh, more waste because online, we do a lot of online shopping and it generates a lot of waste. So in our um, endeavor to change the behavior of people in their way of managing their waste, by segregating at source in their household. And we call our program Trash to Cashback Program. And it's now gaining popularity where an equivalent environmental points is given to whoever exchanges their recycled materials in our material recovery centers, where they can, of course, redeem by getting groceries. Uh, food from our partner restaurant outlets, pay electricity bills, which Quezon City initially is doing already, buy in Lazada, an online shopping store, by using environmental points, and more coming partnerships. We just started it this year with the idea because of this pandemic. And we call our members Echo Warriors. And you know, we have a lot of Echo Warrior now. And I, I told our group that we should have, I bet you I, I need 1 million Echo Warriors. Give me that 1 million. And surprisingly, there are so much people interested into also complying what is needed to take care of their own waste. So this is data driven. And that's why big corporations, commercial establishments, schools, local government units and government are partnering with us to get data and also comply with their sustainability goals. The recyclable waste collected are also brought to partner recyclers. And uh, we need some technologies for that to, you know, we have, we don't have much of that here. So, and even residuals and single use plastics we also accept because right now we have a refuse derived fuel plant, an RDF that process these materials and is used as alternative fuel for co-processing in cement plants instead of using coal known to be contributing much to global warming. The rest of the residuals are disposed in our own sanitary landfills. So as a waste provider, 
we are using a closed loop system where we collect waste, implement waste diversion through recycling, do composting for biodegradable waste, and dispose residuals in our sanitary landfills. That's all, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. So I can already see you have the holistic approach for the waste management. You have the co correct ideas. So now you have to win the hearts of the future waste uh, warriors uh, to get it going and to may have a big rollout of the whole system. So now last but certainly not least, uh, Mr. Tularak, can you give us your ideas, suggestions, or which technologies you might need for Thailand? The floor is yours, Mr. Tularak. Um, as, as you heard about a lot of challenges in, in Thailand, but we have some uh, opportunities as well. The, the FDA is uh, drafting the, the new standard for recycle content for food and beverage containers. So in other countries, they already allow the food content, container to be made of recycled plastic, but the existing law in Thailand uh, does not allow, but we're going to have a, a new law to, to allow that. Then the, if that happens, the recycled plastic will be more in demand and the, the value will be increased. So the recycling of, of PET or other plastic that contact with the food and beverage with, uh, with, will be in, in demand. So this is another opportunity. And we are lucky that the recycling industry in Thailand is uh, quite big because we can recycle almost all kinds of basic materials, paper, glass, aluminum, metals, plastic, several kinds of plastic we can do. But the, 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 the problem that we still need is difficult to recycle material. For example, the multi-layer milk carton like a tetra pack, that's the kind of thing that we still have problem. But if you have uh, technology to separate the fiber and uh, aluminum sheet and uh, plastic content in, in those tetra pack or milk carton, then maybe it's uh, useful for, for Thailand. And also other ma multi-layer material like uh, potato chips uh, pouch that you can see that it's not only plastic, but it's aluminum and plastic and many, many things. So we need uh, solutions to this kind of material for recycling. And on the, on the upstream, on, on the upstream, then for start, starting technology, because it's still a long way to have Thai people sort segregate properly. I'm not sure if you can help. If we use existing mixed waste, that means it's mixed many things, food waste and plastic waste and, and other recyclable together. I'm not sure if the Austrian technology or other European technology can sort this kind of mixed waste. So it will be easier, but uh, more expensive, I know, but at least the, the, the transportation costs and recycling costs in Thailand uh, are still low. I mean, the, it may be compensated with the high cost of sorting that has to, uh, maybe you can study on, on this also. And if we go back to the, the origin at the, the source of, of waste, the generator, that means each household. Another technology that might be interesting is when you have the RFID on the waste bin or something that when the waste, the truck co collection comes and then they check the weight of your waste and then can report the weight and charge the, the fee according to the weight using that kind of Technology is a pay as you throw system in, in Europe. So uh, we, in, in Thailand, we don't have that, but I think it will be useful also. Yeah. So that's about the, the idea that I can think now. 
Okay, thank, thank you kindly, Mr. Tolarak. Now, I think all the viewers uh, from the Austrian participants and the international participants here in Asia have a clear idea what is needed, what the demand is. So I would like to ask all and everyone participating in this day's Austrian Technology Day, please arrange and organize your B2B meetings, get to know each other, exchange ideas, best practices, and then we take it from there and make it bigger and make it a real success because that's what's all about it. Now, I would like to close because we are already slightly over time. It was a true pleasure to have you all on this Austrian Technology Day. It was, I think, a real success. It was very productive. And yesterday, by Idris, I think, from Papenas, the planning ministry in Indonesia said, water is sexy. He didn't know that waste is even more sexy. So it was a true pleasure to have you all. Thank you very much for participating and please <laughs> arrange the meetings and take it from there. Thank you very much. Have a nice afternoon. Have a nice day. All the best to you. Thank you. It was real fun. Thank you. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much.